Buju, Fred Keller Indigenous Cause, Sandstone, Minnesota, Inda Nungum, Nani Madana Ashinanan, Inda Sobibunigis. I'm learning to speak Ojibwe this summer, and what I just said was hello. My name is Fred Keller. I live in Sandstone, Minnesota, and I am 55 winters old. I'm a musician. I play the mandolin. This is a mandolin. It's like a violin, but you play it like a guitar with a pick. I've been living up here for almost 20 years, and I've been playing music since 1994. That's almost 30 years. I play Irish music, bluegrass music, old blues, all kinds of old American music. And I like to dig up stories about Minnesota. I like to find weird, old, strange stories, talk to old timers, and go to museums. And then what I do is I take those stories and I write them into songs. That's from a little video that I made with my daughter over this summer uh, for uh, the Mankato Traverse de Sioux Area Library System. It was aimed at kids, so you'll have to excuse the, the uh, sort of stripped down language. <laughs> but if you want to watch that whole video, it's about 45 minutes long, stories and songs. Uh, I've just posted a bunch of links in the chat section. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, you can see there's a button that says chat. So you can take a look there. There's some links. I've also included links to my Facebook pages, my website. If you want to order CDs, I've mentioned the prices and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, I'm not going to mention that stuff much the rest of the show. Uh, I'm just going to launch, get right into it, because uh, this, this first one here is going to require some help. And I'll put my glasses on so I can see the screen a little better. I have that. I'm not exactly sure whether I need my glasses or not. Uh, this first song is a voyageur song that I wrote after, well, I, I, I poked around, I've dug a fair amount of research, but I guess probably the lion's share of the stories come from this book. Can you see this all right? It's called The Voyageurs by Grace Lee Knut. And she wrote this back, I think, in the 30s or 40s. It's still in print, part of the... Uh, Minnesota History Society or Minnesota History Center uh, book offerings. It's a marvelous book. And this is, this is I think, a, a little known story except for Voyager aficionados. Um, back in the day, there was a very important fur trading post, a Northwest fur trading post at Fond du Lac, which is a French term that means the head of the waters. It was the most important one of the most important fur trading posts on Lake Superior. That was the first place that all the voyageurs from Montreal paddled to. That was their main destination. They brought in their, in their canoe du Nord, the giant Montreal canoes, which could be 30 to 40 feet long. They brought tons of trade goods, and much of it went to Fond du Lac. And that particular fur trading post was responsible for trading with most of the northern forests, up, uh, not including, it didn't go all the way up to Grand Marais, but, but all along the north shore and then northwest, about 25 miles east-southwest from Fond du Lac. There was another northwest fur trading post at a place called Big Sandy Lake. How many of you have ever heard of Big Sandy Lake? Hands or shout out? Yeah, all right, good. We got some, we've got some historians in the group. Good for you. You better be. You, you belong to a historical society. Um, that particular fur trading post was really important to the Northwest Company because Big Sandy played into the Mississippi. So they could literally trade all the way down to St. Louis or New Orleans. But they had to be supplied by Fond du Lac. And that 25 miles between Fond du Lac and Big Sandy Lake was, was known to the voyageurs of the day as the worst portage in the entire Northwest Territories. And the entire Northwest Territories included pretty much everything in Canada to the Rocky Mountains and north to the Arctic Circle. The reason why it was so awful is the first bit along the San Luis River uh, is unnavigable. If you've ever been to Cloquet, Minnesota and seen 
at Jay Cook State Park, how wide and rocky and rough that river is, you would be a fool to put in a birch bark canoe because it will be dashed to matchsticks in the span of about five minutes. So they had to carry all of their goods up what was known the, as the Grand Portage du Saint Louis, the great stairway, the great portage of the St. Louis River for many miles until it was safe to navigate in canoes. So once they got into their canoes, they could paddle for a while. But eventually what happened is that the river, they had to sort of veer west and they got off on a place called the Old Savannah Creek. And the last two miles were especially rough. Old Savannah Creek, which leads into Big Sandy Lake, is not so much a river or a creek as it is a morass, a swamp, a mire. And these guys had to unload all the canoes. They were up to their noses in muck with all of their gear, all of their canoes over their heads. I'll tell you a brief aside. I once went to the Boundary Waters. And the first portage that we had to do was 117 rods, and the, a rod is about 17 feet long. So this was somewhere in the nature of about, I think, a half mile. Um, we hadn't factored in mosquitoes. As soon as, we put, as soon as I put that canoe on my shoulders, the entire inside of the canoe filled up with a cloud of mosquitoes. Uh, and it was so nasty, I couldn't walk. I had to stop. We had to dig out the bug spray. Well, they had bear grease <laughs> and all kinds of nasty things. They'd slather themselves. But they'd have to walk the last two miles through muck and mire. Uh, and that last stretch was the absolute worst. But they were able to finally get to Big Sandy. Sometimes that trip, that 25 miles, could take as much as two weeks long, apparently depending on the weather and all that good stuff. Now, the Voyagers were a tough crowd. Uh, John Jacob Astor once said famously that he would take one French-Canadian Voyageur over 10 American workers any day of the week. These guys were tough, and they prided themselves on their toughness. Just a couple of quick facts. They had to carry 90-pound sacks worth of goods by foot along the portages. They didn't each carry one. They carried at least two. The strongest, the Bonga brothers, who were Minnesotans, um, could carry four. <laughs> Nobody else was known to carry four packs. And they didn't walk or trudge up the paths. They ran. Time was money. And they were driven. So they ran an, a, a, as fast as they could to get back into the water where they could paddle. And when they paddled, especially across the Great Lakes where they had clear, a clear road, a clear paddle, they would paddle for sometimes 14 to 16 hours a day. They, par pa they paddled one stroke per second for up to 14 to 16 hours a day. They were much, not much more than five foot four. <laughs> they were peasants. They were usually French. Uh, descent, uh, Catholic by training, um, but they had a lot of interesting beliefs, one of which will factor into this song. Now, this is a song that I wrote about this particular portage. It's called the Old Savannah Portage. The name of the song is the Old Savannah Portage, and I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need you guys to be my voyageurs. Now, the voyageurs, they love to sing. They, they passed the time by singing. The steersman in the back would start a song, uh, one of the old famous ones that goes back to the 1400s, 1300s, is called On Rulan Mabula. And all the voyageurs knew that one. So the, the steersman would sing the verses, Behind my house I have a pond, On Rulan Mabula. And all the voyageurs would come in on On Rulan Mabula. Well, my song's called The Old Savannah Portage, and we're going to start off with this call and response. What do we say when we haul away? And your job in your homes, rattling the roofs and the rafters as much as you can, is to shout back or sing back, Row, my bully boys, row. Row, my bully boys, row. Should we try that? Oh, what do we say when we haul away? 
Roll my bully boys, roll. There we go, lovely. And what do we yell when the north wind swells? Sufa, sufa, li- ah. You probably don't speak French. So I'm going to have to teach you a little French. This phrase goes like this. Sufa, sufa, le viel. Try it. Sufa, sufa, le viel. Very good. Le viel means old woman. Sufa, if you were to see sufa spelled, it looks like souffle, but it's pronounced sufa. The word sufa means blow. It's the command. Blow, blow, old woman. And the reason why the voyagers said this was because every hour they were entitled to a pipe break. So they'd be canoeing along in the middle of Gichigami or along the banks of the San Luis River, and when an hour had passed, they would call a pipe break. They'd have five minutes to load up their pipes. They'd take out their tobacco pouch. They'd take a pinch of tobacco. They'd throw it in the air, and they would say, blow, blow, old woman. I mentioned that they were Catholics, but they had a lot of interesting old pagan beliefs, one of which was that they conceived of the North Wind as an old woman. Whether or not they picked that up from Native Americans or that was something they brought from the homeland, who knows. But that is reportedly what they would say as an invocation for the North Wind to either blow them speedily on their way or to keep the bugs off. Who knows? (laughs) But we're going to say that. So let's try the whole thing. What do we say when we haul away? Row my bully bully boys. It doesn't matter how chaotic this is. We're having fun and we're going to enjoy ourselves. And what do we yell when the north wind swells? Sufa, sufa, love yell. So load up your packs and bend your backs and summon all of your courage. You can bet your buckles we had a little trouble at the old Savannah Portage. We six brave men, we voyagers, agreed to undertake Of a long time up from Fond du Lac to good old Sandy Lake So we loaded up our packs and we bent our backs And we summoned all of our courage You could bet your buckles, we had a little trouble at the old Savannah Portage Oh, what do we say when we haul away? Row, my boy, boys, row And what do we yell when the north wind swells? Sufa, sufa, love Load up your packs and bend your backs and summon all of your courage. You can bet your buckles we had trouble at the old Savannah Portage. Now Joe Girard, that mighty man, embarked from our canoe. He took one look at the thick black muck and he laughed like a baboon. He took a pack on his chest and one on his back and one in either hand. And so fast he sank that still I think he's not yet hit dry land. Now what do we say when we haul away? Row, my lovely boys, row, row. And what do we yell when the north wind swells? Load up your backs and bend your backs and summon all of your courage. You can bet your buckles we had a little trouble at the old Savannah Portage. Mosquitoes carried off Boucher away off in the woods. The leeches covered Belanger and they sucked up all his blood. Pierre, Antoine, and Jean Aubon, they wandered off the road. And the thorns and the briars like razor wires stripped off all their clothes. Oh, what do we say when we haul away? Row, my jolly boys, row. And what do we yell when the north wind swells? A super, super levy. Load up your backs and bend your backs and summon all of your courage. And you can bet your buckles we had a little trouble at the old Savannah Gorges. There I stood, the last brave man in the middle of the swamp. When I heard a sound that shook the ground and then a mighty stomp. This monster splashed with a thunderous crash and he stared at me with scorn. So I strapped the pack to the moose's back and I rode off on. 
on his horn. So oh, what do we say when we haul away? Row, my lonely boys, row, row. And what do we yell when the north wind swell? Super, super, love yell. Hello, different backs, bend your backs, summon all of your courage. And you can bet your buckles we had a little trouble at the old Savannah Portage. You can bet your buckles we had a little trouble at the old Savannah Portage. There you have it. I got to check my list. I've got so many songs here. I'll never get through them all tonight. So you'll have to, uh, if you have any requests or if you want to hear about anything particular, or if you have any questions at all, feel free to use the chat. Does everybody know how to use the chat feature in Zoom? No. No, in the bottom of your screen, you should right see a there. little button right, right underneath a picture that says chat. And it will open up a little window to one side of the screen yeah. where you can type, just like um, an email or in Facebook or anything like that. So feel free. Otherwise, don't hesitate to interrupt me while I'm yakking. I can yak for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll start while you're thinking and figuring out how to work the chat and if you have any questions. I'll get started on the next song story. This is a song called The Red River Cards. And this, of course, ought to be a subject near and dear to Wadena's heart because Wadena was directly on one of the three main Red River Cards trails. I believe it was the Woods Trail that yeah. cut through Wadena. But the story of the Métis is less known here in Minnesota. The word Métis is a French word that means mixed. You've possibly heard the, the name or the term mestizo, which is a term uh, typically not polite, but it's used to refer to a mixed race person of Spanish descent in the South. Well, Métis refers to a French voyageur who stuck around. You see, the, the voyageurs came in, in lots of different styles and sizes. The two main distinctions were the hivernants and the mangeurs du lard. The hivernants were the, were the voyageurs who stayed in the high country. We, Minnesota, this area was known as the high country. The mangeurs du lard, the, the, uh, the eaters of lard, were the voyageurs who came out for a season and then went back to Montreal to eat really well. And they were sort of looked down upon by the hivernants, the winterers. The winterers stuck around. And they often, the French at least, married into Native American tribe, Dakota and Anishinaabe tribes. And after a few generations of this, because they started back in the late 1600s, after a few generations of this, Métis people came to be seen as a separate culture. In Canada, they still continue to be a vibrant, recognized second or separate culture. Not quite indigenous, not quite white. Here in Minnesota, something very different happened. They existed here. They were very important to our history. Um, they lived up and down the Red River. See, when the, when the fur played out, when all the beaver had been hunted to near extinction, the marten and the fox and all the rest of it, they moved west, and they began hunting bison in the Red River Valley and points further west. So they would hunt bison all year long, all summer, spring, summer, and fall, and then they would assemble their carts, which were drawn by oxen. And the carts were about six feet tall. I'm six foot tall. If I stood up, I'd be out of the picture, but you, you, you can get the idea. Wheels are six feet tall. They can hold somewhere around a half a ton of, of fur and goods. Whoa. And the point about them being, the, the, the Métis were, were often at odds with the powers that be. Because in the North Country, the power that was, was the Hudson Bay Company. There was no government in Canada. There was a Hudson Bay Company. They set the prices. They made the laws. They set the employment figures. They hired you or fired you. You lived and died by the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company, parenthetically, is the oldest 
company in the world that is still ex in existence. They were founded in 1670, and you can still go to Hudson Bay Company stores in Canada today. So the Métis were French, the Hudson Bay Company was English. There's another reason for fr friction. <laughs> the Métis styled themselves the gens libres, the free men. And by free, they not only meant living free, but they also meant trading free. So when the United States of America came and established a separate market in opposition to the British, well, they built their carts and they came down to St. Paul and they sold wherever the price was better. And it was often to the Americans. It was a 40 day trip, but it was worth it because they were able to get more money and more trade goods. And they had their base of power around Pembina. Pembina at the time was part of the Minnesota territory. It is now in North Dakota, just on the uh, west side of the Red River. And it's an interesting town. It's an old town. And the importance to Minnesota history was this. When we were, a when we were applying for territoryhood, the rule was you had to have 5,000 white people in your territory to qualify. Well, we didn't. Unless we counted the Métis, up in Pembina, of which there were something like 15 to 1800 living around the town. So they sometimes farmed as well. <coughs> so they counted them to apply for territoryhood and were successful. 10 years later, when it came to become a state, when we decided to become a state, we had to establish who got the vote. Sadly, the Métis did not qualify for that. They weren't quite white enough to receive the vote. They had quite a number of battles with the British fights. The one famous one's called the Battle of Batoche up in Canada. The Canadian Mounties were formed specifically to put down the Métis uprising. In 1875, they were led by a man named Louis Riel, who was talking to our governor, I believe it was Sibley at the time. He had, was in correspondence with Ulysses S. Grant, our president at the time, we were thinking of sending aid, but it was too far. And by the time we had made a commitment, that particular rebellion had been put down. Many of its members had been captured. Louis Riel was eventually, uh, he was a French Canadian Catholic. He was tried by a jury of white Protestants and hung. Now I went up to Kitson County. This story's getting long. I better play my song soon. But I went to Kitson County just to talk to people, just to I'd never been up there. I wanted to see where the Red River carts came from. And I met a man named Ed Jerome. If you want. Ed Jerome is descended from a man named Andre Jerome. Andre Jerome, two generations prior, was a Métis trader. He built Red River, Red River carts. He traveled to St. Paul. He hunted bison. And he fought with Louis Riel. I was, uh, taught, I was told the story of how Ed Jerome's great-grandfather was captured by the British, taken to a place called the Stone Fort uh, in Winnipeg, and he was what they called sweated on the Stone Fort rocks. And what that meant was in the middle of January, he was stripped nearly naked and made to pound big rocks into little rocks until he got the message and ratted out the rest of his compatriots. Well, he never did. And oddly enough, they let him go and he came across the border to Minnesota and continued his way of life. Um, the Red River Carts and the Métis people in Minnesota faded and the main date was 1862. When the Dakota uprising happened in the southern part of the state, it became perilous to be known to have Native American blood. So people with Native American heritage shut up about it. Ed Jerome said, we were not to talk about that part of our history. And it's only in his lifetime that it has become okay to talk about that. And Ed actually builds Red River carts. He's a history reenactor and he travels around probably your neck of the woods to rendezvous and things. Well, here's my song, my tribute to the Métis people. Let me see, I got the wrong tune in my head. Well, the 
red river carts roll on, boys. Red river carts roll on. Over hills and plains of snow and rain, the red river carts roll on, boys. Oh, the red river carts roll on. Boys always have been lost. I used to trade a pelt for a rifle and a belt. Now it's all priced at a cost. Boys, all the old ways have been lost. And the Red River carts roll on, boys. Red River carts roll on. Over hills and plains of snow and rain. The Red River carts roll on, boys. Red River carts roll on. It's a long ways to St. Paul, boys, long ways to St. Paul. So load them up high and off we'll fly, a 40-day one-way haul, boys. It's a long ways to St. Paul, and the Red River carts roll on, boys. Red River carts roll on, over hills and plains of snow and rain. The Red River carts roll on, boys, are oh, the Red River carts roll on. Oh, well, the wheels, they squeal and groan, boys, the wheels, they squeal and groan. They complain all the way, both night and day, though we give near a moan, boys. Wheels, they squeal and groan, and the Red River carts roll on, boys. Red River carts roll on, over hills and plains of snow and rain. The Red River carts roll on, boys. The Red River carts roll on. Well, they sweat me on the stone for the rocks, oh boys. They sweat me on the stone for the rocks. Drink hell with a Louis Riel, but they could not make me talk, boys. Yes, they sweat me on the stone for the rocks. And the Red River carts roll on, boys. Red River carts roll on. Over hills and plains of snow and rain. The Red River carts roll on, boys. Red River carts roll on. When I travel so it's a rising up the bow and I feel gold pen and little reel and roar boys when I travel so and the red river carts roll on boys red river carts roll on over hills and plains of snow and rain the red river carts roll on boys red river carts roll on and I shan't the love rouge vivant la charte la rivière rouge vivant Thank you so much. It's been a treat being here. Boy, this is the first time I've actually performed in front of an audience that I can see since last February. I've done a little bit of live streaming over the summer. But I'll tell you what, if you ever have an opportunity to help a performer, this is what performers need. <laughs> Some FaceTime, uh, a little bit of tip money, a little bit of payment, whatever. Uh, demonstrate how to play the mandolin. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to talk about that. The mandolin, by the way, is tuned exactly like a fiddle. I'm going to step up to the camera so you can see this. It technically ha it has eight strings. But they're tuned G, G, D, D, A, A, E, E. There's two, two strings of each note. It's tuned just like a fiddle. If I had a bow, I could play it almost like a fiddle. But you play it with a pick. And now my strap has just come off. So excuse me a moment. Let me put this back. But yeah, I'll, I'll come up to the camera so you can see the strings a little bit better. You see how they're doubled? Yeah. And this was made by a fellow, I don't know if you can see the brand, Brentrup. Hans Brentrup, he lived in, he still lives in North Minneapolis. 
and he built this back in about 2004. I started playing mandolin somewhere around 1995, I think, or six. Um, my first job was at the Renaissance Festival playing guitar and singing solo Irish songs. That's what I did. But I met some people there, got in a band. And so we played all the pubs in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, and eventually what happened is that our fiddle player left, leaving a glaring hole where we needed a, a lead instrument. So I bought a cheap mandolin and I started learning tunes. And it, uh, it took me a long time to learn how to play the instrument. I could play the tunes, but I couldn't actually play my instrument. Uh, and it's, it's been a very long evolution for me of playing a lot of Irish music. Uh, and then I saw a concert at the Cedar Cultural Center somewhere around 2000, 2001. And I saw the Del McCurry band and they have Ronnie McCurry plays mandolin. I thought, Oh my gosh, you could do that with a mandolin. <laughs> so I started getting the bug to play a little bluegrass and I had a bluegrass band called the whistle pigs for a good number of years. And we played all over five States and Saskatchewan. And I've taken a lot of lessons from a lot of people and I'm always trying to improve as best I can I mean, I'm 55. Who knows how much better I can get? But I keep trying. Uh, and my, I guess my main teacher, my main inspiration is a guy named Mike Compton. Mike Compton. Look him up. He's a phenomenal musician and a great mandolin player. All right. I need to put this one down because I've got a few mandolins that I want to play. Let's do one here on this. Yes, that's the kind of mandolin. This, this is a mandolin. But those of us of a certain age will know exactly what this is made out of. Anybody want to venture a guess? The urinate. It, it's urinate, a bed pad. A bed pad. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can, see the, can you see the label? Oh, I'll take my tuner off. It's called the commodium. <laughs> um, and the, the deal is the old blues guys back in the teens and 20s, they used to play something called a banjo lin. It looked like a very small banjo but it had eight strings like a mandolin. And the thing was so shrill that it could take wallpaper off the wall. It was horrible. It was great for recording. The historic aspect of that instrument is that it was important before there were microphones. Before there were microphones, you walked up to a big cone and recorded your music, which cut a groove on a record directly from your voice as opposed to playing into a microphone and having that sound transformed. The louder the instrument, the better groove it cut. Uh, the fellow named Keith Carey in California makes these. This is a story about a fellow in my neck of the woods, uh, Finlayson, Minnesota, back in 1920. There was a man named uh, John Kosky. John Kosky in 1920 was 16 years old. In 1920, the Model T Ford was about 11 years old. John Kosky had grown up much of his young life wanting one thing in the world, and that was to get his hot little hands wrapped around the steering wheel of a Model T Ford. <laughs> he had a couple of problems. One of which, that he was a Finn, and he was a Finnish farm family, and they weren't about to start paying him to do work that he was supposed to be doing for his food and board uh, like the rest of the family was expected to. And the other thing was he did get a job. He, he wound up getting a job, but it was 13 miles away right here in Sandstone, Minnesota. I live in Sandstone, which is right on Highway 35, about halfway between Minneapolis and Duluth. There was a Sandstone quarry there, the Kettle River Quarry. He got a job. But of course, he had this little problem. He had no way of getting to work. Well, I found out about this little problem at the uh, Pine County History Museum where they have his bicycle. He bought himself a wooden rimmed bicycle and he, he, re he pedaled that bicycle from his farm out near Finlayston, Minnesota to Sandstone, 13 miles one way, 13 miles back home every day, seven days a week, for about three years. So 
So this is his story. Well, I rattle on the gravel on my way to work. Yes, I rattle on the gravel on my way to work. Well, the wooden rim bike is all I can afford. I'm saving my money for a team on four. For a team of four. Oh, well, I take it easy, Johnny. Don't you hear the whistle blowing? Yeah, I take it easy, Johnny. Don't you hear the whistle blowing? Oh, well, I gotta get home in time to finish my chores. Saving up my money for a T-Model 4 in Minnesota about him, one of which is that he owned the last gray horse business in Minnesota, in Finlayson, Mr. John Minkowski. <laughs> Get to hear about some really interesting folks. A little more voice, I've got a note. I can do that. How about we just take a little bit off the mandolin and add some more. All right. I'm going to try to hurry up here. We had a request for this from Lina. I get, sometimes I get asked where I get these ideas. Where do I do my research? Um, this is a book many of you might know called Old Rail Fence Corners. If you don't know this, I heartily recommend it. It was commissioned by the uh, early Minnesota History Society. Back, and this book was published in 1914. I got lucky and found myself a, a hard copy first edition, and it didn't cost an arm and a leg, but it's still in print. And what they did was they interviewed as many of the original settlers to Minnesota, the white settlers, as they could. And there's story after story um, about bear encounters 
right where Minneapolis, downtown Minneapolis is now. Uh, people surviving on potatoes and maple syrup for six months during the middle of winter. Um, people who hadn't seen money, a U.S. currency for two and a half years because of a recession that we went through. This one is, sort of unites a lot of theme. The, one of the themes that I kept hearing was, we didn't have a neighbor for 30 miles. You know, we were all on our own. We were all by ourselves. So I call it, I've never been so lonely. Well, up in Minnesota, we got land for miles. Oh, I built me a cabin that stayed for a while. Till the snow came down, the drifts and piles. I've never been so lonely. Barrel filling the snout and the ducks and the geese just to pull it out my weeds. Cause they all fly off and as quiet as a church bus. I've never been so lonely. Chiefs tent delivering the medicine. The Braves came by with a big haunch of venison. Gone by dawn, those bear clan Bedouins. I've never been so lonely. Winter from start to finish, so it took me a wife, but she don't speak English. All she ever cooks is beets and spinach. I've never been so lonely. Ought to drive my tears, but I ain't seen a green back in three long years. I wonder if the army needs volunteers. I've never been so lonely. Mm -hmm. Well, time passed by, and they built them up a town with the clang clang trains, people crowding all around. I dream of telling everyone to quiet down. Oh, well, I wish that I was lonely. Wish that I was lonely. Uh, I've never been so lonely on my mandola. This is, uh, if you're familiar with classical music, you know violin and viola is lower. Same thing for the mandolin world. This is a mandola, so it's just a little bit lower in pitch than a mandolin. I've got time. Oh, if I, if I hurry up, I can get three or four more in. All right. Got to do one Civil War soon song, I think. Um, I met, I met the man who wrote this book, but he didn't really write it. He collected, he, he had inherited the letters from his great, great, whatever father, great, great, great. It's called My Dear Wife and Children. The fellow's name is Nick Adams, and it's, by, uh, it's about Robert Griffin, Richard Griffin, I believe. Oh, excuse me. David Griffin. David Griffin had moved to Fairmont, Minnesota, in about the late 1850s from Connecticut. One of those Easterners came out here to make his fortune. And then when the Civil War hit, like so many of his compatriots, he rushed to enlist. But Fairmont was a fair ways away from uh, Fort Snelling, and he didn't make it in time to enlist with the 1st Minnesota. He did get into the 2nd Minnesota Regiment, which was also a rather storied group of men who fought in the east and lasted all the way through the war and took part in the grand 
uh, parade in Washington, the Victory Parade. Now, this is a remarkable series of 101 letters, and I love them because they tell the story of a man, not the war, not officers, not fighting. It tells the story of a soldier stuck in the middle of nowhere, just making do the best way he can, telling his wife, loan the oxen to the neighbor and get a little bit of money. Plow the north field this month so that you can put weed in. Uh, figuring out how to make a little extra money and send it home. It's a beautiful book. September 1861 My dear wife and children just a few lines How I weep to see us with our brand new guns The band to play and gaily And the boys all marching bravely They're paying us a glistening in the sun so kiss the baby's nerve and save one for your own and write to me as often as you can a soldier I will roam in six months I'll be home and we will be a family once again My dear wife and children, just a few lines How you'd laugh to see your father dear I cook and do the laundry while you farm and tend the babies Will you know me if I'm gone another year? Kiss the baby's nerve and save one for your own and write to me as often as you can. A soldier I will roam in six months I'll be home and we will be a family once again. My dear wife and children, just a few lines. Well, slaves live lives too awful to recite. I'm not for abolition, but this poison of oppression, we feel our sacred duty thus to fight. And save one for your own And write to me as often as you can A soldier and a roam In six months I'll be home And we will be a family once again My dear wife and children, just a few lines. Oh, we move up to the front tonight. The longer we're apart, the stronger grows my heart. These cords of love that bind us so, so tight. So kiss the baby's nerve and save one for your own and write to me as often as you can. A soldier I will roll in six months I'll be home and we will be family 
once again November of 1863 Mrs. Griffin It is my painful duty At Chickamauga Creek They laid him low when none that knew him but came to love him and he never turned his back upon the foe so kiss the baby's nerve and save one for your own and write to me as often as you can a soldier in six months I'll be home And we will be a family once again Since we're such a good audience, can we hear you sing something Irish? Irish? Well, bless your soul. Yes, but it might require just a moment to determine something. I'm, I probably will have to pull up a cheat sheet so I don't forget the lyrics. Uh, but I'll do one I learned. This is, this is probably one you've heard of. Mm -hmm. If you'll give me a moment here, I'll pull this up. Probably might even remember this I one. Might even remember. Yeah, I probably don't need the cheat sheet so much for this. When, when Irish eyes are smiling. <laughs> oh, the, that one would be more difficult. Oh, that's. Uh, don't have the to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I never learned that one. I know of the song, um, but I here's one that you've probably heard before. It's called the Wild Rover. Oh, the Wild Rover. Have you ever heard that song? been a wild rover for many's the year and i've spent all my money on whiskey and beer but now i'm returning with golden great store and i never will play the wild rover no more and it's no nay never now here's where i'm gonna stop because in the pubs, here's what you do. And it's no, nay, never. Clap, 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 clap. No, nay, never, no more. Clap, clap. Will I play? Clap, the Wild Rover. Clap, no, never, no more. Now, this is an old pub. This is probably 150 years old or early 1800s. So I want you to try to do the clapping as best you can. And remember, who cares if we mess up the Zoom call latency? We'll have have fun. I've been the Wild Rover for many a year. My wife's online. She can help with the claps. Missy, you're still there. You can help everyone with the claps. And I've spent all my money on whiskey and beer. Uh, but now I'm returning with Golden Great Store. And I never will play the Wild Rover no more. And it's no Nay, never. Clap, 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 clap. No, nay, never. No more will I play the Wild Rover. No, never, no more. I went into an ale house I used to frequent. And I told the landlady my money's all spent. I asked her for whiskey. She answered me nay. There are plenty of custom like yours every day, and it's no, nay, never, no, nay, never, no more, will I play the Wild Rover, no, never, 
no more. Put me hands in me pockets, put sovereigns bright. And the landlady's eyes open wide with delight. Oh, stay, sir, oh, stay, I was only in jest. I have a wine, I have a rum, I have a randy, the breast, and there's no nay, never. Right up your kilts, no nay, never, no more. Will I play the wild rover? I know never, no more. I'll go home to me parents, confess what I've done. And I'll ask them to pardon their prodigal son. And if they'll forgive me as they've often before, then I never will play the wild rover no more. That is no nay, never. Clap, 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 clap. No nay, never, no more. Clap, clap. Will I play the wild rover? Clap. I don't never. No more. Now you want to hear the risque lyrics that I learned at the Renaissance Festival? No. No? Oh, all right. <laughs> well, I've been a wild pervert for many years. A year, and I spent all my money on black leather gear. And now I'm returning with whips in great store. And I know that I play the wild pervert some more. And it's ooh, ouch, thank you. Ooh, ouch, thank you some more. And I play the wild pervert. Oh, never, no more. It's a very silly place, the Minnesota Renaissance Festival. <laughs> bravo. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Now, how much patience have you got? Have you got time for one more? I know, Lina, you wanted to get everybody out at eight. But I have, well, I, I won't tell you how many songs I've got left, but I'd, I'd love to do one more for you, if that's all right. But you tell me. Well, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. You one more. If you need to leave, just leave. Yeah, that's fine. No. This is, uh, I usually do this as a closer. It's called Don't Make No Fuss Over My Names, <laughs> Over My Remains. I got this song by reading old newspapers. If you, I assume you, you guys know how to access uh, archives of old newspapers uh, because you are associated with the History Society. Yeah. Um, I was reading one from March, early March 1904, and there was an obituary, two paragraphs entitled, Don't Make No Fuss Over My Mains. And it was written in vernacular. A black woman named Margaret Stitt had passed away. And Margaret Stitt was listed as a laundress. She was a popular person who left a, who has had a large number of both black and white friends and left a, quote, not inconsiderable amount of money. The service was going to be held at the home of a man who was a grain merchant. Turns out he was a white grain merchant. I looked him up. But it was to be officiated by Reverend William Sampson Brooks, who was the deacon of the African Methodist and Episcopalian Church, a very prestigious and upstanding, important black church in, in the United States. This, this particular deacon was from Delaware, and he went on to take a tour of the Holy Land, and he wrote a book about it, a fascinating book about a black man in the Holy Land. Um, well, I was very curious about this because, first of all, there weren't too many African Americans in Minneapolis at that time. They were numbered in the hundreds, not thousands. Um, and to have a large number of both black and white friends, that's remarkable. So, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find out a lot. I did discern that she was a laundress. She lived on Ninth Street in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, pretty bustling area nowadays, lots of big, tall buildings, but back then it was residential. <clears throat> the only other hint I ever got was by reading a book called The Minneapolis Madams. And if you've, ever, if you've never read this book, I recommend it. The Minneapolis Madams. It's a story of the sex industry in Minneapolis between roughly the late 1800s and somewhere around 1930 to 1940. Because in Minneapolis roughly from the Hennepin Avenue Bridge and six blocks south, covering what is now St. Anthony, Maine, on both sides of the river, was a more or less legal brothel trade. 
and they were owned by women, not men. Now, the deal was they struck this deal with the city fathers that they would be allowed to run their businesses without police interference if they paid a fine once a month and the police would stay away. The, 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 what, what happened is that they were, the police asked them not to, to make sure that this industry was, didn't get out to more upstanding neighborhoods. It was a way of zoning the sex trade and it was largely successful. It did keep prostitution away and it did allow interesting freedoms. Minneapolis had some of the earliest gay pride parades in that district. The only building that still exists is, a, is an old red building. It was, a, it was the brothel of Ida Brown. It's near the Izzy's Ice Cream, if you ever do the river walk. Um, now, here's the connection with Margaret Stitt. Margaret Stitt was a laundress. Guess who used most of the laundry facilities in the city of Minneapolis? The brothels, because they were constantly changing sheets. <laughs> So it is entirely possible that she had connection to this community because of the work she did uh, and the people that she knew from those trades. At any rate, I decided that Margaret Stitt was far too interesting a woman to allow just two paragraphs. So I wrote this song and those, you historians, I will leave this as a sort of a scavenger hunt. I peopled this song with very famous people of the day, some of which you will recognize, some of which you might not. My time upon this good green earth is drawing to a close. I bid you fond farewell. I go to take my last repose. Mr. William Frazier, my dear friend, I charge you thus. Hold the service in your house, a church I do not trust. The Reverend William Sampson Brooks will pray me to the Lord, but keep my coffin covered, made of simple clean pine boards. Bring my friends around me, white or black, do not restrain. And I'll make no fuss of my remain. Don't you make no fuss of my remain. I don't go to any trouble. Keep it simple, make it plain. Meekness and humility have been my life's refrain. Don't you make no fuss of my remain. Go get your James J. Hill to hand out 10 cent cigars. Go ask Georgie Pullman for his fanciest cars. Governor Van and lead a steamboat parade. Why don't you make no fuss? Oh, my remains. fighting first. I will fire 21 guns off the back of my hearse. How about a Lowry Street car in my honor name? Don't you make no fuss over my remain. Don't you make no fuss over my remain. Don't go to any trouble. Keep it simple. Make it plain. Meekness and humility have been my life refrain. Don't you make no fuss over my remain. Twin City streets. Oh, Kellogg and Hormel might want to pass out these. I want a river of glitch beer flowing in the water main. But don't you make no fuss over my remain. Don't you make no fuss over my remain. I don't go to any trouble. Keep it simple, make it plain. Our meekness and humility have been my life's refrain. But don't you make no fuss over my remain. Now please don't spend what time remains a weeping or my corpse. 
I want you all to laugh and yell and sing until you're hoarse. So how about a eulogy by my friend, old Mark Twain? And I'll make no fuzz of my remain. Don't you make no fuzz of my remain. I don't go to any trouble. Keep it simple, make it plain. Meekness and humility have my life to refrain. But don't you make no fuss over my remains. I said, baby, I don't you make no fuss over my remains. <laughs> All right, folks, I've, I've kept you 10 minutes long. I apologize for that. But I've had a, an absolute blast being with you today. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Check the chat or check in with Lina and Ben. Uh, I put up links and all kinds of things. You can keep in touch with me. And I'm going to get back to doing some live streams here in about a week when I get back from the North Shore. Um, I sort of put it down, but I'll be doing some live streams a little bit, a little bit like this. Some uh, old time, some Irish, some blues, whatever, <laughs> whatever I've got in me that day. Um, so check me out on Facebook or whatever and thank you very